Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Thomas Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. On this show, I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Today's episode, it's sponsored by Barrels Ahead. At Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a -a one-of-a-kind marketing strategy one that highlights your authenticity, tells your story, and connects you with your ideal customers. In short, we help wineries and craft beverage producers unlock their story to unleash their revenue. Go to BarrelsAhead.com today to learn more. Now today, Bianca Harmon, our D2C strategist, is joining us again. How's it going, Bianca? Going really good, Drew. I'm excited to talk with Angelica today. Yes, today we have Angelica O'Reilly. I'm super excited to talk to her. She's the co-founder of Owen Rowe Winery and DeStaff DeStaff Wine Company. Welcome to the show, Angelica. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you on. So Angelica, tell us a little bit about um, how you got your start in the industry and making wine. Oh gosh, many years ago, back in 99, um, our family started own a winery. And um, back then we did everything from, um, from the vineyard all the way to the bottle. And we continued to do that with our family for many years. Um, so as we had children, they you know, were in play pens or backpacks or whatever, um, whatever they were, you know, however they were at the time in the vineyards, picking grapes right along with us, eating them as we picked. And uh-huh. Then, you know, on the sorting line in the winery as they grew older, um, high schoolers would work after school, um, crushing grapes, cellaring, um, you know, punching down, bottling, everything that was involved in the wine business. So we got started in the winery way back in 99. And the reason why we did, um, we started, we were in the wine business is because my husband and I always really appreciated a family lifestyle from Mm. farm to table. And we wanted to do something off the land. And wow. that would be, so we were thinking, well, maybe cheese, cheese making. We both mm-hmm. love cheese or wine making. And so we visited a bunch of farms, you know, kind of walked in the muck and just like, really didn't, we loved the idea of having cheese, but not <laughs> making. <laughs> and then we visited a lot of vineyards. Of and, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So then we went to a lot of vineyards and fell in love. So mm-hmm. we just decided that was where we were, were going to start. So. Um, he started off making wine while I did all the extra things to keep us going. And, um, there we went. So our children were always a part of it. And, um, our what son is a wine before, in California. Um, what did you do before the wine business? Well, we, we were both in college where we met, mm. we got married and uh, he worked in a winery. Oh, okay. Um, after, so first we started, we, we were kind of searching for, um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to start a family. Like, uh-huh. what do we do? How do we, what are we, how are we going to support our family? What's our, we wanted a farm to table kind of a lifestyle, sure. but we were down in California. So it was a little more, it was difficult to actually start in California. Uh-huh. It was a very expensive place to live. Um, there weren't a lot of vineyard lands for sale, but we could actually get the skill down there. Uh-huh. So David started working in the winery while I started doing other jobs just to, to keep us going. And then um, a couple of years into it, um, he was hired at a winery in Oregon, which is where we really took off with our winemaking. And um, then we started a few projects on our own. And then in 99, started Owen Row. Oh, okay. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. So what was that? that what, what appealed to you about Oregon? I mean, I love the Newburgh area. My, wife, so, my yeah. wife's from Beaver Creek. Um, oh, cool. Not, not quite yeah, close to there, so- but close, closer than California is to there. <laughs> Right. Well, it's a long story. Well, first of all, California is where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and David is originally from Ireland. So he (laughs) coming down, his family moved out to um, British Columbia, Canada, and still all his cousins, all the rest of his family's back in Ireland. Well, he wasn't used to the climate in California. Mm. And every time he would do a drive from BC down to uh, college, he would just fall in love with these rolling green hills of Oregon and for him that was where he he, he just wanted to settle and um he fell in love with Pinot Noir 
And um, I wasn't a fan of Pinot Noir. It was more of a, of a cab and Syrah uh-huh. kind of person. But, um, but I was willing to give it a go. So mm-hmm. um, given that it was, um, there were opportunities in Oregon as opposed to, you know, the opportunities we had to start in California just weren't there. So yeah. we moved up to Oregon and it was close to his family being in British Columbia, we're only five, six hours away. Mm-hmm. So that's how we chose Oregon. Oh, it's, a, it's a beautiful area. So flash forward. So Owen Rowe, it's phenomenal wines, but now you've got a few other ventures. And the one that I'm really curious about, so De Staff is you have, so you have five daughters. Four daughters. So four it's daughters. five me. So it's oh, five, four of us. Five four, of you. Four yeah. daughters, me, five, five of us all together. So yeah, yeah t- talk talk to me how talk to me about the staff and um, this family operation. So my daughters have always been in the in the wine business, working behind the scenes mm-hmm. with me, um, and we've done everything from office work to vineyard work to lab to winemaking, cellaring, everything in the wine business. But um, we kind of thought, well, the guys get all the credit. And girls mm-hmm. really don't get a lot of credit here. <laughs> so they're mm-hmm. working really hard. And, um, you know, we, I made labels. My daughter created labels. So we thought, well, um, it came time for us to, to look at Owen Rowe and think of what we wanted to do with Owen Rowe. It was very, very large for, for a family business. So we decided to sell Owen Rowe. Oh, okay. And at that point, we decided to um, start a winery of our own. So my daughters and I... Um, thought, well, we can do this on our own. We can, we can showcase women. And so all of our labels have um, some image of a woman on it in some sort of profession. And um, we also wanted to, my daughters are, um, you know, being of the millennial and um, Gen Z generations, they wanted to uh-huh. um, do things that were very clean and truly sustainable. Not yeah. just, I mean, our farming practices and owner have always been sustainable. We, we farm organically, we use as, as, you know, natural vineyards as we can. Um, even, you know, very ethical with our employees, mm-hmm. um, just all the way down to, you know, everything about our winery was, was true and good. So we decided, well, we can carry that a little further because when we did wine tastings and wine events, we noticed that um, <laughs> there was an, a vast amount of waste in the box. Oh yeah. So you'd go to, oh yeah. You'd go to a wine event and there'd be, you know, so there's 11,000 wineries in the US, right? Mm-hmm. There's like 900 and just in Oregon. And that again in Washington. Oh, but I think there's a less than that, maybe 700 or something, but you count the southern parts and it goes up mm-hmm. a little more. Anyways, that's a lot of glass and only 31% of glass is ever recycled. That's Isn't just that amazing? And also the fact amazing. that when you think about wine bottles, those are not using recycled glass. <laughs> so, no. An uh, event after event, like we'd be at a, a huge like wine spectator event, for example, in, in New York or Las Vegas, mm-hmm. wherever they happen to be held. And we hear the, just the clanging of the glass at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And we're like, where is the vast amount of glass going? It's, it's not being recycled. It's not it's just being thrown somewhere. And if it is being recycled, well, it takes just as amount of gas um, emissions to uh, recycle that glass as it almost does the first time to make it. And the first time to make glass is almost double that, what's well, almost like 70% or more higher than it is to make a PET bottle. And not so you're the cost of the glass bottles that people are paying these days. So you're paying an enormous am- amount of money for yeah. the glass as opposed to the PET. So a lot of your cost in buying wine is in the, is in the packaging. It's in the right. glass. It's in the it's in the box. It's in the it's in the fillers that you have to put in to protect that glass. That's very fragile. And so with the PET bottles, they're half the weight. We can stick them in a in a box. We have engineered a box that is perfect size to fit twelve bottles in. Mm-hmm. We have a six um, bottle box and a four bottle box, and you can you don't need any extra you know um, protection on, mm-hmm. the, on the PET. No, oh, again, no. Just, no card so nothing. So when, no, so when it comes time to recycle, you just throw your entire bottle recycling bin, you throw your box in the recycling bin. It all goes in your, your home recycling. Uh-huh. And now talk, talk to, it comes to, to the average to the average consumer, the PET. Talk talk to them about what that was just plastic, because this is some pretty revolutionary pa- packaging for, for right, right. In fact, um, um 
little side point to Australia, a lot of, a couple wineries in Australia, big wineries in Australia just went PET with a couple mm-hmm. of their friends. And they're producing a lot of PET in their factories. So now what does PET stand for? I was going to say, for people so that don't know. Polyethylene tethylacylate. Okay. <laughs> so I think, <laughs> So it's a it's a product that at high temperatures is molded into whatever shape you want to shape it in. It and it is plastic and it is, it's, but it's, it's a, the good it's a plastic. Non-BP, yeah, it's the good it's plastic. Non BPA, um, yeah. right? No BPA has a uh, you know no um, nothing that is dangerous to your system. It doesn't have. There's no leaching in it. It's been tested for. The only way it could leach is if you were to uh, like I don't know microwave your bottle or put it at super high temperature. <laughs> But you don't do with wine. I mean, I'm sure where there's a will, there's a way to find it. But you right. probably should not be doing that normally. Right. If you're, if there are any danger of of leaching with that PET bottle, wine, you've already cooked your wine. You don't do that with a glass <laughs> bottle. <laughs> so when people ask that question, oh, what about you know leaching? Are you worried about that? Well, no, because we don't put our wine in those kind of temperatures. You mm-hmm. destroy the wine, regardless of whether it's glass or, or um, plastic. So um, yeah. So PET is one of those. Um, products that um that is also infinitely recyclable and as many times as you recycle it it also um cuts down on those those gas emissions by percentages so and it can be recycled into um clothing car parts um you know kitchen tupperware microwavable tupperware just a whole bunch of you know plain parts whatever you you know whatever you need them for they can be recycled into. So there's an infinite amount of, you know, uses and an infinite amount of times it can be recycled. Like you can keep recycling PET. And it keeps its integrity. That's what I love. It's integrity. integrity it's a like, very, yeah. Like the surf it's trunks that I was wearing this morning were all from plastic bottles. Yes. So it's so, a very strong plastic. That's It's not that flimsy plastic that you, in fact, people have to actually pick up our bottles to know that they are, that they are glass. I mean, plastic. Yeah, from this so look at camera that. angle, they look yeah. like a glass bottle. It mm-hmm. looks like a glass bottle. And it is um, plastic. People pick it up and they squeeze it and they just can't believe it. It's, it's, it's one of a kind. And, oh, that's fantastic. Um, so the cost, yeah. so talk to me about the cost. I mean, this is, a, this is a really interesting subject for me. To, I mean, the cost to produce glass bottles versus the cost to produce a PET bottle. We're talking cents to dollars. Isn't I mean, that amazing? It's, it's bad. It's, it's enormous. I don't have the numbers in front of me and I wish I did. But in the but general, I, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah, it's, it's like a third of the price, if, if and, even that. And you so, said your daughter came up with this, correct? So we, when we had Owen Rowe, we were approached by a company in um, London to put one of our brands into a PET bottle. We weren't quite ready to do that. And um, there was a lot of uh, back and forth between us but the bottles were a different shape. They didn't look like bottles. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a no brainer for me. I didn't look and go, Oh yeah, I'd like to see my wine in that kind of a a, a packaging. They were, um, they were tall. They had the same kind of a neck, but it was a flat, um, a flat surface, almost like um, a flat box. So it was rectangular and it was made to fit in the mail slots in Europe. So they could just pop their bottles and they would bounce because they're not breakable. Uh So you know, it's an ingenious idea, but in the U.S., we don't have mail spots like that, and I didn't want to pack. And you know that in the U.S., we would we would have the problem of them tipping over in the shelves. There are a number of things that weren't we weren't quite ready to do that. Sure. So I put it on the back, but that that's a great idea. We'd like to revisit that sometime. So my daughters and I were deciding what to do um, as far as um, coming up with a product and how we wanted to package it. Um, we decided to try PET, but mm. where do we find PET? <laughs> yeah. Like who makes it in the U.S.? Well, we did find a company out of California and they did, we bought all the PET they had. And um, this was during COVID. Mm-hmm. So um, we, yeah, so it was, it was a challenge, but um, we were able to bottle our wines using this. And we wanted to use the same to make it simpler, we wanted to use the same PET bottle, same shape. So no difference between the, you know, a Bordeaux and a Burgundy bottle. It's sure. all the same shape. Um, so, it's not, so there's no <laughs> bottle challenges, or is there a challenge right. with the bottling line? Well, there sure was. There was, we brought one bottling line in. They had mm-hmm. 16 trucks, of which only one could do this kind of product. Oh. So 
And then when it came time to do, we wanted to change our capsules to a Nova Twist, which was a, um, it's, it's also a PET. So, so if there were any, let me back up a little, if there were any kind of leakage or any kind of oxidation, any kind of issues with mm -hmm. the PET at all, it wouldn't be through the plastic itself. It would be in the, in the capsule. Sure. So, because you have, you have um, aluminum on, on plastic. So we yeah. wanted to go plastic on plastic. Plus there were some other stores um, that wanted to, um, that wanted to carry our wine, but asked us if we could do um, plastic on plastic. So it was a one-step bottling. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, one-step recycling. So sure. um, we said, sure, we can, we can investigate. So it took us a while. But we found one um, company that came to our winery and um, backed in his bottling line and worked with us for a whole day, which would have just taken a, an hour or so to bottle our wine. It took us a whole day to figure out the, just the fitting on the top mm -hmm. because no one had done this before. So we we're the first people to do the plastic on plastic. So now we have it. Now we have the science. We have, you know, we have the, um, the truck. We have, we, have what, we have what we need to make it happen. And where are you getting the the capsules from now? The plastic capsules. So are we we actually yeah those are all local too. So we're getting everything okay. that we can. We we did order some um, original ones from France, and that was that was a delay in our bottling because it was it was so far away. But we're trying to get everything as local as possible because and that was the only place that had them. We want to have everything as local as possible to also cut down on um, on the fuel. So. Mm -hmm. So even with our shipping in our, um, our PET product, these bottles fit in half the size of a box that not, it's even smaller than that when you consider the packaging that a mm -hmm. glass case takes. Um, this is, you know, just a fraction of the size. And so you can fit twice as much in one truck that you can for glass. So you need two trucks of glass to one truck of PET. Sure. Plus the weight is yeah. so much lighter. It's half so the weight. So wine about caring. so a case of wine is generally about thirty six pounds. So we're looking at about eighteen. So we we weighed we did this test on one of our um, I think it's on Instagram or something. My uh -huh. girls do a lot of social media, but um, they're really good at it. But um, they did a little test, and it was like forty one, forty two pounds for the glass versus twenty. So I mean, it was exactly half, and they have yeah. it on video. So that's you put it on a scale, measured it. So, I mean, in the end, too, your consumers are probably paying less, even shipping wise. They're paying less in shipping. So, we ship free because we can absorb those costs, but you can't ship glass free without it really affecting no. you. Mm -hmm. Unless you're selling, unless you're shipping in enormous amounts. You know, so, but tell me, are these wines then, are they more of, uh, you know, you're not storing and saving these wines. These are like, like drink now wines. Then, okay. Correct? So there's another question for the industry. There, yeah. there have been um, tests or um, data collected, I should say, on um, the pattern that um, consumers are, um, are drinking now. And most consumers drink um, wine, if not the day of purchase, within a week of purchase. Mm -hmm. So there's a vast majority of people that are buying wine to drink now. And mm -hmm. there's a small amount of people that are buying wine to lay down. And mm -hmm. so we decided to make our wines to drink now. So we make very judicial um, decisions on, um, you know, when it comes to harvest mm -hmm. um, on, you know, what, um, um, what, what the acidity levels, what, what kind of tannins we want, because they have to be perfect in the bottle now because mm -hmm. the wine that's being put in the bottle isn't going to change what you open up and drink now is what you're going to open up and drink up in two or three years mm -hmm. if you save that bottle it's not going to change whereas a glass bottle you actually we, we made wines traditionally in a style where they were you know the tannins had to had to mellow out in the bottle the acidity levels were high um you know and they're beautiful over time but you had to be willing to lay that bottle down for five, 10, 15 yeah. years to get it at its best. And people just don't drink like that anymore. Yeah. You would still think, though, that a wine would evolve in a PAT bottle because it doesn't. Still, the, yeah. There's, it's there's, because of the way the product is. There's no oxidation at all. There's no, um, there's nothing to make it um, change. Hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, I thought there was an anaerobic kind of option to that. That's amazing. Yeah, that's, yeah it is amazing. I mean, that's I actually a benefit a for a lot of people. Yeah, and I think it's a break from the industry, and I really hope a lot of people do it. We've been asked by a lot of people, why don't you guys, you know, copyright this or, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, you patent on it or whatever. But mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not a personal thing to us. It's more of a we really feel the wine industry needs to change. Yeah. It's kind of old, stuck in the mud. Everybody's stuck on their, their glass bottles. Nobody wants to change. Mm -hmm. While these millions of bottles are being tossed into the earth and they don't break down for millions of years. And they're just sitting there on the earth. They can get, you know, crushed, but it's about as small as yeah. they'll get. So are you helping other wineries with this process now? Um, we are not because we are, uh, as a brand that we're developing ourselves and okay. we're concentrating on what we're doing. And what we want us, you know, our mission, but we don't, we don't hide it from any other winery. And if people ask us, where do you get, you know, where do you get your supplies from and stuff? We'll help them out, but no one, no one wants it. I mean, in fact, in the industry, um, I think winemakers agree that this needs to happen, but no one's willing to take that step. Well, I think the consumers um, one day maybe demand that step. Oh yeah. The consumers are, we have, so that's one of the things about, we have a um, wine club that's called a subscription. And it's mostly online and we have reorders. Um, and we've never seen that before in the industry where people just keep reordering their wine by mail. So mm -hmm. it's, it's almost a breakthrough in that way as well, is that people know that they can get their wine right at their door. There's, there's nothing they have to wear. They can actually throw it in a suitcase. They travel with it. Um, we had one person in here who was a scuba diver. My daughter told me uh, just last week or the week before, and he had, he was at some scuba diving event and he had a glass bottle with him and it shattered and shards got into his suit and it took him, it was a huge process and a big ordeal to get every last bit of glass out of that suit. Oh my God. And he said, came in and bought plastic and said, from now on, I am never taking another glass bottle with me. It's only going to be PET and that's why he buys from us. And again, I've heard it from, um, place resorts. They don't want glass around their swimming pools. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, golf courses there's places that just don't want glass oh yeah of, you know so it has there also been a negative side of it at all do you ever get the you know consumers love glass too right because yes. so, stigma yeah. around it right so yeah, so, yeah that's a good question because we do have people come in with a lot of questions and oftentimes it'll be people with questions that they really don't want you to answer they just want to challenge you on it and they go uh, away with all their questions answered you go oh didn't realize you know, it's just a matter of education, I think. I think people have a um, misconception of what plastic is and mm -hmm. how it can be dangerous to you if you, you drink out of plastic. Um, they have, you know, the story about the heat and, you know, all those questions we can answer. And um, so they go away believing and signing up for our, our mailing list. So, yeah. That's, I mean, because it's, it's just like almost like sometimes the cork versus the screw cap debate with red wines, you know, and they're yes. like, there's no way you can age this red wine with a screw cap. Well, yes, you can actually. Yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we approached that one too. <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> so this is a little different in that, um, you know, yeah, yeah. The, the, you know, the, the screw cap was a little hard to pass. Mm -hmm. Um, those times but this is a little different because it's the whole bottle we're asking yes. people to change the entire bottle and people who have a certain idea of the romance of what a bottle mm -hmm. should be like have a really difficult time just holding that squishy bottle and <laughs> turning the cap but most people drink their their wine you know casually with dinner or over the week it's mm -hmm. not people are taking if 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 people would only um bottle wines in glass that they intend to age over time that would be fabulous because they will cut down on the amount of glass that's out there but the vast majority of wine isn't made for yeah, the you're talking about thing. five percent no. of wine should be in glass right right the rest of them the are just being consumed. There. there's a time and a place for it right exactly and the consumer goes out there to buy wine for tonight's or a wine birthday party they're having, or a girl's night out, or whatever they're having it for, mm -hmm. they buy it for the now. They're not buying it to lie down in their cellar. So those types of, I'm not, you know, I'm not dismissing glass altogether because there is a time and a place for it, but I think we have an entire waste 
of glass in our yeah. in our industry. And I think it's a big problem. I think our industry is a lot has has there's I think our industry is responsible for a lot of the um, gas emissions in mm. our atmosphere. I think that our, our industry has to change that and it has to be answerable to you know what's going on in our in our atmosphere right now. Well, mm. and if you even just think about just the tasting rooms alone, like a big tasting, like I live in St. Helena, right? So a big tasting room that sees hundreds of people. Think about how much waste is coming just from the just from the tasting room portion, yeah. glass wise, where it's like you could make put those in PET bottles and right. it, you know, and then if you have, you know, I, I worked at a winery where they there was this whole debate one time between the corks and the screw caps, and so they sold both um of like their high-end red like because mm -hmm. some people just had to have the cork where others like were fine with the screw cap you know right. where you could even maybe if you just feel the need to make glass where you're at least splitting the difference between the two you know yeah so you've got some yeah it's uh, this is a this is a fascinating subject you've got so you've got a pretty revolutionary idea that you're enacting and that's through um want to i want to talk a little bit about no man wines and um this this family all the daughters and you all working together for this what's it like what's it like yeah, having your yeah. i mean it sounds like it's the realization of your dream when you graduate from college have a family be on the farm um work with my family and it's i sounds like you're doing it yeah so it's it, that's really interesting because it hasn't been just you know this very smooth transition uh -huh. My daughters did, get, they all went off to college and they did their other things. One was traveling in Italy at the time, it was during COVID. So mm -hmm. they were all in different places. And we decided at that time to all convene at our house. And so convening at our house is when we started to kick around these ideas and say, hey, let's make this happen. And um, working together has been a challenge. We all have our different talents, but we're careful not to intrude on the other person's talents mm -hmm. and their, their strong points and let them really you know flourish in that in that area uh, on the other hand there's times where we all need to to step into an area we don't like wow. <laughs> and that's a challenge because so there are challenges as there would be in any kind of a business um but it's more of a challenge when you're intimately connected to each other so um but you know my husband and i have always worked together um you know wife and husband teams does he, does he feel <laughs> left out are I was going to say, is he a part of this at all? No, he's our biggest supporter and he's our <laughs> biggest advisor. And um, eventually um, we will have a family wine included in our packaging that he and I oh. make together. So he's not left out. Okay. So, um, um, but uh, being our biggest supporter, I think gives him a lot of pride and joy. He's very proud of his girls, especially because they're so talented. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the labels are designed by my daughter who um, is um, Navy military. <laughs> and, oh, that's, um, and the mural be behind us. I see the girl on the ladder there um, yes. painting. Yeah, all her artwork. So everything that is, is a, that is a fantastic artwork. I love yeah, it. She is incredible. And then um, our oldest daughter worked in restaurants. She managed restaurants. And she did um, all the marketing for a cidery in California and um, she knows marketing. And so she takes care of that aspect of it. Our mm -hmm. other daughter is, um, Mora is very talented with hospitality. People love her in the tasting room. They love her with events. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of step aside for her to do that. So we all have our strong points that we, we all know. We all have to recognize it and just mm -hmm. say, you're really, you're, be you're better at that. So you, you go and do that. Mm -hmm. So, and none of them like paperwork. So uh -huh. <laughs> guess so who that falls <laughs> <laughs> So, and then you want to see a piece of paper in the winery that's like, take a picture of it and file it, um, you know, in the clouds. <laughs> yeah, so that falls upon me. So, um, and I'm fine with that. So, and then who's making the wine? We all do. So it, they're made at different places. We, we do a lot of, um, you know, custom fresh kind of thing while we're getting going. Um, but um, we actually go out to the vineyards. I was in the vineyards this morning. I was in the vineyards last week look at the grapes. And then we work with um, my husband, David. Um, we work with him on um, what sort of flavor profile we want in the wine mm -hmm. for it to be a drink now wine, because that's a huge challenge. Sure. Um, so we need a lot of advice on that. So even though we decide what the final blend will be, 
and what the final product will be, we get a lot of advice. So now I, I got to ask this because we're now in, we're recording this in the middle of August. And okay. well, I'm at Valley, you guys were off to a really rough start at the beginning of this year with the frost and the freeze. How yeah. is how is the harvest shaping up now? Yeah, so some of that is made up. I mean, a very good is to really bring a new life. What was that? I don't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Noman. <laughs> okay. That no, yes. Was that no, no, that was me. Oh. I don't no. know how that got in there. <laughs> Anyhow, that, that was a okay. Okay. nice So, so um, yeah, so we got off to a rough start because we had that late freeze mm -hmm. and we already had, um, we already had, um, you know, the bloom. So we, it was mm -hmm. a lot of the, a lot of the, um, um, the grapes, the, the, um, the sorry, <laughs> a lot of the, the blooms were frozen. So we, we will not get a lot of, um, we won't get the, um, the tonnage that we would normally get. Um, but what is there is actually looking really, really good. I saw okay. some of it today in the Lama Valley. It's looking really good. So we'll have a lower yields, but they'll be beautiful. So. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, that's that's great news. So the yeah, well, the, for the some vineyards that was a complete, yeah for some um, vineyards though it was a complete loss. So mm -hmm. it, it just depends on where you are in the valley. So. Mm -hmm. I was just up that way a couple weeks ago. I wish I would have stopped by. Because you're in the Willamette Valley, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 And anytime, I mean, visiting our tasting room is, you know. And you're yeah, currently anytime. in the tasting room, right? I am currently in the tasting room. So we have the murals and um, yeah. And we have a, a number of tables. We open the back door. We have a view. So it's actually a nice place to hang out and visit and enjoy wine. That's fantastic. So, so Noman's the one label. So, t talk to me about the the O'Reilly landscape. You got you're planning on the O'Reilly family wine coming out, and what's what's the future? I guess what's about, the future like? <laughs> yeah, well, I can't tell you too much about that yeah. now. It's still in the planning process, but you'll see it when it comes, and it, it will it will hit. <laughs> well, that's great. But you yeah. also still have your distaff, right? So yeah, we so we have the distaff wines, and the distaff wines are in glass, and we do not ship. And that is, they are made to, to last a little longer. Mm -hmm. So I'm not opposed to glass, um, but I'm opposed to shipping and I'm opposed to, um, to making wines that are drink now in glass. And so, and those are also teaching varietals and they're varietals that um, are normally used in a blend. So you take Petit Verdot, for example, and there's, you will be hard to, for you to find a, uh, straight petit verdot. Mm -hmm. Petit verdot are usually used, you know, in, in France for um, for color, for extracting color, and, and usually in percentages like ten percent. You know, just color three. and so, tannins. Tannins, and the, because the petit verdot is really hard to ripen, and in in those areas where they're planted, they don't ripen, so they don't fully ripen. So they ripen enough to extract colors and tannins, but not to get their full flavor profile. So we actually have vineyards in um, Washington. And, and um, actually our Petit Verdot is from Walla Walla mm -hmm. and that um, fully ripen because of the climate and, and the soil, they can fully ripen and we can showcase uh, that varietal and make an educational piece. And so one of the reasons for doing distaff is my daughters when, um, you know, they would go out for, with friends and ask if they wanted to go wine tasting. They would also often be intimidated by the fact that they didn't know how. Mm. Not my daughters, their friends would be intimidated by the fact that they didn't know how to how to go wine tasting. And so my daughters would say, um, well, it's really not that hard. You just tell me what you like. Tell me. So we decided, well, let's let's make this more of an educational piece. Let's bring people into our, our tasting room where we can teach them about varietals, teach them about, you know, a straight cab franc, a, a blanc franc, a chasse and so, a petit verdot. And so mm -hmm. we have those varietals where people can come in and ask questions. We can tell them about where they're from and um, what they taste like. And in fact, we've done a few tastings with um, six, just a Morved or Blanc Franc, where we've taken four or five, maybe six Bordeaux, uh, sorry, um, Blanc Francishes or Morveds uh, from around the world, um, especially where they originated from. And um, so people can extract from that, um, that line of wines what a Blanc Francish tastes like, what a Morved tastes like, what a Petit Verdot tastes like. So we're doing more of an educational 
a thing with our distaff wine. Distaff means the better half. So it's, you know, the better half of the family um, showcasing wines and educating people on varietals. I love that. I, I, I would really dig that. Just get those educational tastings, you get so much out of it. You do. You do. And it's, it's, we like it to be interactive. So we want people to tell us what mm -hmm. they are picking up in these wines. And then when everybody starts to do that, you start to extract, oh, this is the common thread here. This is, mm -hmm. this is what a Petit Bordeaux actually really tastes like and what it looks like and what the tannins are like, what the structure is like, what the texture is like. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of that, you know, it's, it's coupled with, you know, there's winemaking styles that can change that, but then you get that in there too. Well, this is, this is different because this winemaker does things in this style. So mm -hmm. you can even extract that from it. Oh, well, that's, that's fantastic. That's a lot now, of fun. Now we're now is the distaff tasting room close to Nomen, or is it? So, so distaff tasting room houses Nomen. So okay. Nomen is one of the best. So distaff wine company is the wine company that's going to that houses Nomen, and eventually all the the O'Reilly family wines. Oh, okay. So Sorry, I'm, I'm a little slow on that. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. It's, I didn't explain that. Well. Get to, oh, okay. Yes. Okay. And so Nomen means the word Nomen. It's a play on words. Nomen is, is Latin for, for name. So we're all O'Reilly's. That's what I thought. And then I was reading, I'm like, oh, it's no man. <laughs> I thought it was no, no men. men. <laughs> no man, it's all girls making it. So, and all girls running it and selling it. So that's the idea behind the no man. So. I originally thought Latin. And then the longer I was looking at oh, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> it took, took me a couple extra minutes. <laughs> Well, say, does that mean no men can have it? Well, no, <laughs> it means that the, the women make it. <laughs> what is the label? What is the meaning behind the label? I've been staring at it on your background and trying to depict what that means. So that is a woman in a, in a profession. So she's in a business suit. So my da our daughters want to showcase women in every kind of profession eventually. So we just got going on these. So here's the farmer. We just started, we did a few just to get going, but my daughter has, she's coming home from the Navy tomorrow and she has we hundreds of these drawings um, on her computer and um, she will start cranking them up. Want to do for their next bottling. So say a Cabernet Sauvignon won't just have the one picture. It will have, I'm going to step away for just a second and grab a couple more bottles. Sure. It will have, um, so here's a couple more labels. They will have different um, pictures of um, women in different professions. So say a cab, instead of having just the one, it'll have like 10 different professions on a one, on one cab bottle. So you can, you can order, like you can say you want a case of, of Cabernet, but I want these six women depicted on it. So you can pick a doctor, a, you know, a engineer, a farmer. So you can pick oh, six different fun. images on your bottle. Yeah, so that'd be a lot of fun. So that's what we're working on next. So. Those would be great gifts and God, works event. Yeah, wow, I love that. Yeah, oh yeah. And we just want to have a lot of fun in the wine business. We don't want it to be this stuffy old world that people come in and say, you know, you, took, you got that out of that wine or that's not what it's supposed to taste like. Or <laughs> we just want people to enjoy what they're drinking and just have fun with it and visit. You know, it's all about the people you're with. The, you know, the food you're having with it, just um, to, to have a lot of fun with it. That's fantastic. So Angelica, as we're kind of wrapping down here, what, where can people find out more about the staff and Noman Wines and get it, get a subscription? Yeah, you can go onto our website and on our website, you can um, actually subscribe to, we have two different, um, uh, two different clubs. One is, um, the unfortunate one is the, it's not unfortunate. <laughs> Unfortunately, with the one, the staff, you can only come into the winery to pick up. So we don't ship that. But the Nomen, fortunately, you can ship everywhere. So we can ship the Nomen um, on, and you can, so you can do that online, but the distaff, you'll have to come in to taste. And um, it's part of the experience. So. Sounds fantastic. Um, well, Angelica, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank and you. yeah, we should share a story and um, it goes in the future. <laughs> Sounds good, Angelica. Th thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. 
We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. Thank you.